but actually having a system to get to that vision. You can have people, some people love data, some people love process, you know, some people are really good at organizing their, their organization. But unless you have it all, unless you can put it together, you miss parts and then things fall over and you go back into that day-to-day -day grind of just making do, you've got to be able to click it almost simultaneously at the same time uh, together to get the full power out of it. Hello and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today I am joined by fellow EOS implementer Cameron Ogilvie who is based in Sydney, Australia. Welcome to the show, Cameron. Hi, Deb. Good, good to have you here. So we've just been having yeah. a bit of a chat before we came on live and I've just been hearing a little bit about Cam's background um, and I didn't realise that Cam actually came from a family business and so I spent many years working in that family business. Would you mind sharing your story, Cam, as to you know, what you did how you got to be in that, and then why you're now an implementer. Sure. Um, well, after university, I, I left and um, went straight into banking and finance and worked there, did my time in London and came back and found that I was, was not enjoying being a um, small cog in a, in a big machine. So I jumped out and uh, into the family business, which was importing and distribution of um, confectionery in Australia. Mm -hmm and something that we had done for 20 years prior. And uh, so I started in the business and uh, worked my way up, eventually taking it over and being the CEO and um, uh, running it and then exiting it um, last year to, to become an implementer. Hmm. Okay. And that's a short version. <laughs> and so what was your role in the family business? Yeah, so I started off in, in sales and uh, became a sales manager and then, and then I took over as the managing director. Uh, overseeing uh, the, the whole company and the direction and the staff within it. Okay, and you, you told you shared with me that you know you came across traction sort of almost by accident by listening to a podcast and hearing about somebody who was using this traction system. Um, tell me about why you chose to to implement that in the business. So the you know I've I've always been obsessed with personal development and uh it's something that was passed down to me from my father and so learning and uh um is a, a big part of uh who I am so I'd listen to podcasts and listen to books and when I was repping I'd be driving around the country and instead of listening to the radio I'd just listen to these books um and I was listening to a podcast and the, and the gentleman just happened to mention traction um, just like it was a one-liner, I practiced traction, and I, and I went, oh, I wonder what that is. And um, I downloaded it, and I listened to it, and I read it, and I loved it. And uh, what I loved about it was, uh, uh, up until that point, I'd uh, I'd done several different operating systems. Like I tried the Goat Game of Business by Jack Stack. I, mean, I love the guy. Um, Vern, Vern Harnish with the Rockefeller Habits. Uh, I'd been on a university course for high growth companies and, and, you know, it was all the same stuff kept coming up and up again and again and again. And uh, it, I tried to implement it in our business to reach our full potential uh, with the management team and within the business as a whole. And for some reason, it just, it kept falling over. Uh, and, and what I found was, Every time it fell over, the, the staff, um, they just got a little bit jaded in terms of trying something new. Here and so, yeah. yeah, here we go again. <laughs> yeah. And uh, when, I, when I came across Traction, I knew that, the, that it was the distilled essence of all of those great books. Um, and so I thought I'm, gonna, I, I'm prepared to have a crack at this. And so we... We, we, we took it on and we, we implemented it into our business and, uh, you know, it just took off. Like um, the, the we just started to get that connection between the vision that I was putting out there and then the actual execution within the business. Mm -hmm. um, and so it just started humming and humming and humming. Um, and, and that's how I got into, uh, into traction and... Uh, <laughs> I guess that's so the, I, no, I'm, just that's really, the I'm really interested in that because I mean, you you would have been. Um, were you aware of the role of like a visionary and an integrator and that sort of thing in the business um, I, before you came across Traction? No. And and is it fair to say you were the visionary in that organisation? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm good at talking. 
<laughs> good at talking, good at big ideas, good at kind of, you know, um, th- so sometimes crazy ideas, but they actually move the business forward. And I think you just made a really valid point, right? So we have this really strong vision, but for some reason we can't translate it into what it means for the people on the shop floor or, or around the organisation. So what you're telling me is Traction actually gave you the tools to take that high vision and bring it down to the ground into something that was tangible for people in the business. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it also... I had heard, like, I mean, on those other, the university course that I went on, the lady who runs it's a professor, and uh, she's the smartest lady I've ever met. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I can say her name or not, but it's Dr. Yana Matthews, and she runs the University of um, um, Adelaide's Business Growth Program. Oh, wow. yep. Fantastic lady, and it was really good. I walked into the first uh, meeting with her and she took one look at me and she said, you're my bright, shiny ideas guy. <laughs> and I nearly fell off the chair because she had just read me like a book in, in, in 10 seconds. Mm-hmm. And that was my first um, you know, awareness of these roles between a visionary and integrator. And I didn't really understand it in those terms. It, you know, people look, talk about a CEO and a COO, et cetera, and the, and the, the labels that we put on the role. Yep. Um, but uh, it, that's where I started to develop the concept of where I was best fitted within the organisation and what was my unique self, skill set. So, yeah, Traction definitely gave me the, the tools to bring – sorry, EOS brought, gave me the tools to bring uh, the vision down to the ground uh, and, and execute on it. But I think that as, a, as an individual, it helped me to see more clearly how I could fit in, what my unique ability was, and, and how I could best serve the organisation. And one of the things that uh, Jana said and, um, and the book talks about is, is being disciplined in your thoughts you know, not taking on every idea as a guy that has 20 ideas before breakfast, 19 of which are not, are, you know, just shit. terrible, <laughs> yeah, yeah. terrible ideas. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the um, being disciplined in, in, in saying what are the good ideas and having a filter for them and then not sucking your team's energy away from what you've already set them to do previously. Mm-hmm. Um, so not distracting the team and keeping disciplined and focused on, on that vision that you've already laid out and set. So so, so EOS, uh, there was a lot of, for, for me personally, it's it's the framework with which you looked at the business was was, uh, was clarified. Yeah. Um, and it just really simplifies well. things down, I think. I mean, I, you, as you said, I mean, there's some great books out there, Scaling Up, Rockefeller Habits, um, great game of business they're they're all really really great but sometimes they're just a bit too complex and I think that's possibly why they fall over is because it just it's too much all at once whereas what I what I loved about EOS was it was a very very simple framework that visionaries like yourself and myself can kind of take and go yep okay it's it's enough to give me a little bit of structure so I'm not kind of you know zigzagging all over the place but still not too restrictive in in terms of um yeah curbing our natural entrepreneurialism (laughs) Yeah, and I think that um, the bit that I really liked about it is that there's nothing revel- uh, revelationary about any part of the of the the book itself or the the tools. Mm-hmm. It's actually the power is in clicking the pieces together yep. and completing the circle of what you're working on. Having that system, when we call it the traction, the execution on a day to day basis mm-hmm. against that vision, but actually having a system to get to that vision, uh, you know that. You can have people, some people love data, some people love process, you know, some people are really good at organising their, their organisation. But unless you have it all, unless you can put it together, mm-hmm. you miss parts and then things fall over and you go back into that day-to-day grind of just making do, you've got to be able to click it almost simultaneously at the same time yeah. uh, together to get the full power out of it. That's absolutely true. And I think you just alluded to, you know, that, that that the beauty of it is that when you do things like the accountability chart, you're actually also giving people the ability to see where their unique ability is and really work within that space, which often, especially in, in smaller businesses or family businesses as they grow, people are used to doing sort of multiple tasks and being involved in the whole part of the business. But in actual fact, there'll be something they really love and they're really great at, and that's where they should focus. Yeah, I mean, I, I love to use this analogy that business is like a, a jigsaw puzzle. You know, being a business leader is like being a, doing a jigsaw puzzle, but there's no rules in business. So you're actually the artist painting the picture on the jigsaw puzzle and you're assembling all of the pieces at the same time. Yep. 
But the funny thing about it is you're actually one of the pieces that you're putting into the organization as well, right? Yeah. And you know that, that time and place where you, you get that piece and you see what it looks like and you kind of see its colors and you, you know its edges and you go, well, maybe it could go here or maybe it could go there. That's like ourselves, right? And you put yourself in a, in a place in a small mm. business because you have to do that work. But it doesn't really fit. You know, it's a continual process of then you've got to say, okay, actually, that's the wrong piece for that place. I'm going to put another piece in. <laughs> Uh, and then it clicks in perfectly. And that's like when you surround yourself by good people and the right seat, right people in the right seats. It's like putting those people in those places. And it's a constant process of moving yourself into the best place for the organization. But you've got to move yourself to what you're uniquely good at. Mm-hmm. If you try to do, if you're a visionary type person and you try to do finance work that's, um, you know, myth- methodical, and <laughs> yeah. it's a recipe for disaster, you know. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and so, you know, that's the, that's the magic. Yeah, no, I completely agree. It's really interesting because, you know, you said that you tried a couple of other dis- different systems and, and they fell over. And I hear this all the time with the clients that I work. I'm sure you do it too. Um, and then they, they do EOS and actually it does work. It is really, you know, it's very simplistic. They actually try to get the results from it. But how did you deal with your staff who were probably kind of going, oh, here we go again, Cam. Cam's got another stupid idea or another crazy system he wants to put in place. How did you um, deal with that with the team? Um, <laughs> that's a great question, and I I could probably answer that the best now that I've actually been implementing EOS. I've probably okay. learned from s- subsequently why it worked, yep. and it's because we take a you know when we teach um, EOS, we take a traction first approach. We teach the tools that get the the ball rolling uh, within the organisation before we go and sort out that vision component or clarify the vision because often the vision is there people people have it somewhere in a folder and you know they, the yeah, owner knows head. what it is yep. in their head and um, but it's getting them to 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 do the weekly the weekly meetings and and you know the ninety day rocks and what's important now and staying focused on that and accountable to to doing those things and and so in my business I followed that I did that first and and so we we got the benefits of you know I was at the time running but as the CEO, I was also the, the sales manager. And um, and in the sales meeting, I'd be having a weekly meeting, uh, a level 10 meeting, and keeping people accountable to what they said they were going to do and doing their rocks every quarter. And, you know, it probably took about nine months before we sort of started to set rocks properly and our priorities properly for the next 90 days. Yep. Um, but when they, when the staff knew that every Monday at nine thirty that we were going to be going through what the priorities were and how they were going against it and what the scorecard was, the behaviour started to shift because they were they were paying attention to the fact that these priorities weren't going away and that the the shiny ideas guy wasn't going to get distracted by a new shiny idea. Yeah. And so they got on board with it and 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 then they saw results and then they owned it and. Mm. You know, went beyond my expectations in terms of what they delivered. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's kind of part of the reason I fell in love with the US myself as well was that we, we I used to work with the Ice House, fantastic organisation, but we would always do these great big kind of vision building days where we'd talk about the vision and the mission and all these things, and then everybody would leave that room really, really motivated and really yeah. excited, and they'd go back into the business and nothing had changed, and therefore yeah. nothing ever got done because they were, you know, they got distracted by the fighting fires. And I love the fact that with EOS we do we, the first part is not the big like sexy kind of vision stuff, but it's actually like how do you put tools in place that will really make a difference? And I can exactly. see why a team buy into that because they can start to see that, as you said, we're not getting distracted by the things. We're actually sticking to things for a reasonable amount of time. We've got some focus. And, of course, we're, we're measuring results as well, which is important. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what was the, what was the, the, the best tool or the most favourite tool, if you like? What's the, the thing that had the biggest impact on your business? Oh, um... Yeah, the, the 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 weekly meeting pulse, yep. and the rocks, um, right. the ninety day the ninety day. Um, I, when I went on that university course, um, we did lay out a, a an annual plan, um, but I didn't tie it down to the ninety day plan particularly well. I didn't tie it down to the nitty gritty of what we had to do now and for the you know. Um, next 90 days Mm -hmm. and then the second thing that worked really well within that was the accountability piece of um the the weekly to-dos you know when you're sitting there in that sales meeting 
uh, and you've had something that's been outstanding for three weeks in a row, you could see people squirming. And yeah. so they started to get it done. Uh, um, and in getting it done, you know, you started to get rocks done and, you know, and then it, it led. So Snowballs. that traction component was um, uh, the weekly meeting pulse was, was just fantastic. Um, and then the rocks, because I, I already had the annual plan and what we would lay out for ourselves on an annual basis. But just that, just the, you know, the traction part. No, I completely can see that. Um, and so what difference did it make to you personally? Because it, obviously it, it helped the business, I understand that, but how did it actually affect your yourself in terms of implementing EOS? <laughs> it gave me a lot more confidence. <laughs> okay. um, you know, I, th- I think... Um, uh, yeah, we, we, we talk about Jim Collins. He's, he's just... My, I'm a, I'm a fanboy. I went and watched him live. Yeah, yeah, I was in the th- third row back, you know. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, and, the underwear at him, not quite. <laughs> so I was going to say that. I didn't, I, yeah. I didn't want to say that. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. <laughs> I would have been thrown out if he saw my underwear coming at him. <laughs> um, but he, but he, he talks about in, um, in in his in his books. Um, uh, the, the you know the in, in the great by choice is my favourite one. Uh, we often talk about good to great, but great by choice has some uh, great analogies in it. And uh, he talks about you know companies that exist in volatile markets that are going up and down. And you know how I looked at business is for the the, the twenty twenty five years that I was in running businesses that you know it was like a roller coaster ride. Mm-hmm. The, the business was. It's always up and down. It's successes and then adversity. And it, I could not believe what came our way. It was one step forward, two steps back, two steps forward, one step back. Um, you know, we, we overcame, um, you know, COVID was just amazing. We had ransomware. Wow. Um, we had to go through succession uh, planning, you know, the ransomware was like the whole company shut down uh, at one weekend and we basically had to boot the whole business up, all of the data, everything, we had to find it and put it back together. It was crisis management. Um, and, and uh, you know, and so, you know, over that time, I just became used to um, the fact that you had to deal with adversity and deal with the roller coaster ride. Um, and I think that the confidence I gained in terms of understanding uh the the you know the tie in between the vision and then the rocks and the traction is that you could deal with anything that that you were um, confronted with um, and how do you deal with it okay well COVID's now we've got the next ninety days what do we have to do you know we have to uh, reduce our hours we have to talk to the staff we have to you know get supplier terms extended we have to get um, um, you know the, the the customers to tell us what they're going to do in terms of their ordering, and um, you know these are the, these became the important things in this quarter that may not have related to the ten year vision, but you had to deal with now. Mm-hmm. And then you could have a week by week, you know, check off that you've done those things, and and it just meant that you know you could move really really quickly if you were confronted with one of those issues. Yeah, because um, you were clear about the, what. You were, where you were headed and what you were trying to do. Yeah, yeah. Ex- and, and you had the tools to, you know, and how to manage yourself um, to do it. Yep, excellent. Okay, so you, you decided um, to, to leave that business and, and now you're doing EOS as a sort of full-time thing. Hmm. Why? Why did you choose to do that? <laughs> um yeah, I, I said earlier that you know my passion is like Ted Lasso, and um, so I started helping um, my um, my mentors. Uh, sorry, I started mentoring some of my friends who are in business, and um, I just loved it. I was we, we'd have a weekly chat, and we'd and I'd talk about the tools and what I'd learned, and you know, and I have this broad knowledge of um, you know business books and theory, etc. And you know, I'd pull facts from different places and. Uh, and they would really get, they'd really appreciate it because I could give them that uh, somebody to talk to that um, understood uh, you know the, the the roller coaster ride that they were on mm-hmm. um, and I had this diverse knowledge base and i had I was doing it myself 
So they res- it, it resonated with them, and, and they started passing me on to their friends who actually were were, were paying clients. So I would charge um, charge them, and um, you know, and then I thought, well, actually, you, you could be quite good at this. Um, and I was listening to the, you know, we talked about that, you know, the piece of the puzzle, right, where you start to see, you know, what colours you are, mm-hmm. and you have to know yourself. And how do you know yourself? Is that you listen to the signals that are out there? You know, what what do you love to do? Where do you get off? Where do you get energy from? Yep. And um, and I started listening to these signals because I'd come off the phone call with um, with the with these um, coaches, I guess, and um, they would. Um, my wife would say, "Have you been talking to so and so?" And I went, uh, "Yeah, I have." And she goes, "You always you're flying. You're just so energetic, right?" Like you know. Um, and they were the signals that said, "Okay, well, there could be something. There was there could be something else um, out there for me um, beyond where I am today." Um, and I guess. You know, I, the way I would summarize that was um, I think I almost felt more excited for their success than I was for my own success in my own company. Yeah. And we were going great. So that was, uh, uh, that's a big deal when you, when you really take a moment to contemplate that um, this yourself, that this is a part of who you are. Mm-hmm. So that was like a, that was an inkling to, to the change. Mm. Pardon? Like an aha moment. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was yeah. exactly that. But obviously you're in your current environment and, and you know, where was I in my current environment was that, um, uh, you know, we, we'd implemented traction and part of, um, uh, sorry, EOS, and part of EOS is, um, you know, you deal with underlying issues. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I went into my company and, my business partner and I had a different skill set and we had a different base and we we just wanted well we just had a different viewpoint on where the company should go or how it should go yep. and there wasn't anything wrong with his viewpoint there wasn't anything wrong with my viewpoint but but we couldn't <laughs> it was just a different viewpoint you know they were both good business strategies right um but the failure to choose between the two of us because we were trying to keep each other happy meant that the staff would come to us with issues of, you know, um, I need half a million dollars of marketing budget to get this ranged in Woolworths or, you know, and, and then uh, another staff member would come to us and say, well, I need this for this packing job and we need to buy a new machine and that's going to cost half a million dollars. So, but you've only got half a million dollars. You can't spend it in both spaces. So you you tend to straddle the decision, right? And therefore the staff weren't getting the results that you're asking them to get um, because there was no, the direction wasn't there. Really clear. The choice choice wasn't made. Um, And it's, but it's hard to see that. Um, you know, when you're in the business, you know, it's very hard to have that perspective because you've been, remember, this is like a 20 year boiling frog kind of a situation, right? Where you, you're working, you're working, you're working and things are going great. You're making money and, um, you know, it's very difficult to, to, uh, get yourself out of that box and have a look at it uh, clearly. Um, and to be fair, so, I mean, th- this business was going really well. I mean, you went from being sort of a small family business to being, the, what, the second largest confectionery importer in, in Australia. Is that right? Yeah, privately owned. You know, yeah. there, were some, there were some big companies out there. But, you know, but yeah, it was, we were really successful. It's not, like you were, not like you were sitting there just kind of uh, chugging along. You were actually doing really well. So that must have been quite a difficult decision to kind of go, hey, what do I, what do, I do now? Yeah, and it, and it came down to the fact that I, I looked at it and I said, you know, I can be comfortable here for 20 years mm-hmm. and um, I can be very financially well off and I can live a, live a good life. But that aha moment that we were talking about previously was, you know, that energy that you feel when you're in it. Like you, you, you really, you know, it sounds a bit, Wanky. Sounds a bit wanky, but <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, in your purpose or in your, yeah. in your sweet spot. And, um, uh, you know, so I, I just said, you've got to make a decision, Cameron. Yeah. You know, do you want to, how do you want to live your life? And I just said to myself, I don't want to turn around when I'm 65 and go, I could have been a coach, I could have been an implementer, and I could have lived this, spent the last 20 years helping people, um, you know, achieve their dreams and their goals and see the power of, you know, getting on, on board, getting on the same page and getting traction against that, you know, vision and doing it in a healthy way. Um, and so it, it, it just came down to a decision. Um, and now, 
I think that you normally start with what are your personal and professional best, which we missed. We did. We should, yeah. we, I was going to come back to it. I had it written down here. So, yeah, what are you, but, what are you most proud of? Because you've, you've done some pretty amazing things. Tell us what your professional and personal best is. Uh, well, my personal best is I had a holiday last week and Yay. I had a beach holiday just before winter and it was very nice to get yeah. a surf in. But, Brilliant. Um, okay. More, Where was more, that at? More, uh, up at Coffs Harbour. Oh, so, beautiful place. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's just warm enough to, you know, as you get north. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the professional best, you know, and I, and I keep reflecting on this, I'm the proudest thing I'm, the thing I'm most proud of is the fact that I made a decision to mm-hmm. live a life uh, on, on purpose and to go through that process with my business partner and you know he looked after me and I looked after him in that pro- you know through that through that negotiation process um which is so it ended well yeah. um uh but it's the decision in the first place that was the most uh difficult thing hmm. the process is hard of selling a business or executing a business yeah. but the hardest thing as an individual is actually just making that decision to go and live, you know, because it's, it's, it's scary. There's uncertainty. You don't know. I don't know if this um, EOS implementation thing works when I'm sitting as a CEO of a business. I, I don't know if people will receive me the same way as they receive, you know, you've got the experience now of many years. You know, you know what it's like. I don't have that. So you're stepping into the unknown. And so my professional best is um, you know, just taking the courage to make that decision. Yeah, and I think it's something you won't regret, I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, certainly we know from our EOS community, I mean, all of the implementers have all run businesses. That's part of the requirement for being an EOS implementer. Um, and I think there comes a point where, you know, you, you're ready to to help more than just people who are in your business. I know I, I love it. I love still run a business, still have some things going on, but enjoy the fact that I get to help others as well. And I know that um, yeah. it, it's not just about business either. So for me, this whole podcast is about the fact that I want people to create create a better business so they do have time to pursue other passions, so they are doing what they love. You know, it really is about having that better life. Yeah, exactly. So you, you've been doing this now. So you, um, how long did, when did you start as an EOS implementer? Back in... Late last year, oh, well, wasn't it? Yep, yeah, yeah, late last yeah. year. Yeah. And so, I don't know, seven months or something like that. And you've been working with, with various clients and things. Um, and any stories you'd like to share around the, the EOS journey so far? Um, I, I've been surprised at the... Um, uh, I guess the... Not the difficulty, but the... Um, it, it's a difficult... It's a simple thing, but it's not easy. Yeah. Okay, and you yeah. get and you, you get in the room with people, and 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 you know, it's a shift in the way that they think, and it's a shift in the way that they do things, their habits and their routines, and that's um, you know, it, 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 it's quite a, I wouldn't say violent, but a, it's a it's a significant shift almost immediately uh, because you don't you don't have the certainty and the confidence that it works. You know, you're trusting what what I tell the people. They're trusting me that what I'm saying is is proven. It's a proven process, and it's going to work for you like it's worked to other people, right? So you get in that room with them, and and, and they're listening to you. And I know from experience that it works. But they, but they're having to they learn it, and then they're having to shift everything that they do. And that's, um, there's a lot of energy in that. There's a, it, it, it's, it's. Uh, I've got a lot of respect for the people that commit to the process because um, it's not easy. Um, but you know, the re- the results are there. And I think in terms of, um, in terms of stories, or the thing that I've enjoyed the most um, is. The, the the way that I like to describe it, I don't know if you've ever been to a chiropractor. Yes. Yeah. So when you get your back cracked at a chiro, you might have had a crick in your neck and you yeah. get your back cracked. And um, for me, it's, it's, it's almost instant relief. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, it doesn't mean that the muscle is fixed. It still takes a few more goes and the muscle relaxes over time and eventually is fixed, right? Yeah. But that instant relief is what it feels like when I'm in a session room. Um, with my with my clients and and they they go through this you know difficult process of you know talking and self you know, uh, analysis and yeah. um, and and then you know they start to they start to clarify their organizational structure and then they, they start to identify their issues and then what are the things we're going to focus on in our rocks and then they see a way of doing you know get, keeping themselves accountable to it and you know you come out of it at the end of the day 
and you know, people are it's, it's always the same remarks it's like i just feel so much better i just feel like i know what i've got to do i can i, um, I know what where what lane i've got to play in you know um and and that's probably been the revelation for me um when i was coaching before i left ctc i was doing individuals and the, it would be great to help an individual but they would walk back into their their business and the business would be the same way when we coach the leadership team, you, you, you're coaching a group of individuals that are looking to help themselves shift together. And it's so powerful. And so when they come out of that room, it's like they're in it together and they've got that, um, um, they've had, they've been to the Cairo collectively and it's that relief. I think so. it's a great analogy too, because you know, when you go to the Cairo, no matter how many times you've been there, there's still always that little bit of, of fear and sort of, you know, because they're going to crack you right. That, that's, yeah. Even though you know it doesn't actually hurt, it's not a comfortable feeling. So I think EOS is a bit like that too, because you go into the session kind of knowing there's going to be a little bit of uncomfortableness, but then once you get past it, as you said, um, things can then start to move forward. And all that. So I love the analogy. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So tell me, um, who is your ideal client? Who do you like to work with and why? Oh. <laughs> um, well, I'm fairly new, so I'll take anybody. <laughs> no, that's not <laughs> I say that I say that with a with a caveat though. I, I do know that um, you've got to be ready, okay, um, mentally. Uh, you know, in my experience, I had been through a lot of pain and tried a lot of things beforehand, so I was ready to to you know give it a real red hot crack. And so the client has to have that willingness to grow and to go through that pain. They're more concerned with not the. Um, then, uh, you know, they don't want to stay with the status quo. They want to move forward in some way, and I think that that's a, that's a, that as a, as the from the leadership perspective, from especially the the principal, yep. that's that's a non negotiable. They've got to be. You can't want it more than them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, completely agree. Yep. <laughs> and I think from a from a company perspective, you know, um, I I enjoy um, family business. I think that um, there's a real personal connection to to what you're trying to do and achieve within a business. Um, I'm motivated by uh, you know, helping the company prosper, but by doing so, if you take an average of 30, you know, our, our target market is 10 to 250 employees, right? Yep. So if you take an average of 30. If we can, if I can help, you know, 250 companies to um, to to improve their prosperity, you're actually helping the seven and a half thousand people. Yeah. But not only are you helping those seven and a half thousand people, you know, you're helping the four pe- family members on average that they would have as well, yeah. right? And you, so you're helping this by making these businesses prosperous. Um, you're helping all of these families and uh, and people live good, better lives. Mm. And so that that's incredibly motivating. So family business is important because they have that connection to the people that are working for them, and the wider community as well. And the wider community, and and yeah, and then from a from a uh, from a passion perspective, obviously I've got a great food background uh, and and finance, financial services. Already, you know, all my friends are work in financial services, so there's um, there's a lot of leads coming from there. But um, the food background is, um, is 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 fantastic. Yeah. You know, we obviously share quite a few similarities. You know, I'm a, I'm a food scientist by trade, as you know, and I, I actually love family businesses, and I think I love it because, yeah, I love the fact that they are creating sort of wealth for their family and their wider community. But I also find that sometimes by sorting out some of the business issues, it actually helps with the family as a whole as well because often, you know, as a family business, you tend to end up doing things that maybe you don't really want to do but you had to do because you were there. And, and then, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes on that makes the the – having the normal family barbecue a little bit tense and if you can actually alleviate some of that and they can go back to being a true family again i think it's it's a it's a double win (laughs) yeah yeah absolutely and you know that 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 analogy is that like uh when you're in a family business i see this all the time you you tend to uh you know um move the organizational chart or the the accountability chart mm-hmm. around individuals because you get good individuals so you move everything around the people and the organization but you have to go the other way around you have to take a structure first approach because people change and what people are good at if you it's like a jigsaw puzzle that you can never put together because the pieces are changing in their shape mm-hmm. 
Yep. You know, so you can't win that way. You have to take the structure yep. and then find the right people to fill them. And, you know, and I think for family businesses, the EOS gives you the permission to do that as well because I think often in a family business it's hard to have those conversations about whether or not auntie, uncle, brother, father, brother, sister, whatever it might be, um, you know, should be there. Whereas if you use the EOS as a framework to guide you, you've got something to almost blame. So, it's, you know, it's not me that wants to not have you doing this role, but actually this is the, the right thing for the business. It gives you that ability to, to call things out. Yeah, I mean, uh, exactly right. Exactly yeah. right. Cool. Okay, so um, I always ask for three top tips, and given that you have got, you know, a wealth of experience in, in running your own family business and in, in, in coaching others and in, in running EOS um, as an implementer, what are your three top tips for people listening in? Uh, number one would be uh, to, to rip off Stephen Covey. You've got to uh, start with the end in mind. Yep. You've got to keep the end in mind all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, to, to paint that beautiful puzzle, you've really got to sketch out the image first uh, in your mind and, and then put it, put it down, right? Uh, you might not have the details, but it, that will come with time. We tend to, uh, and I did this in the early years of the business, we tend to want to... Um, start from today and improve and move forward to, you know, be better tomorrow, okay, mm-hmm. or be better than last year, grow, develop, okay, one step at a time. And th- that is very effective. It's, a, you know, it, it's, it's, there's a lot of successful people that have done that. But it's not as, um, you, you can waste a lot of energy doing that. It's far more effective if you begin with, with the picture in mind at the end, okay. Yeah. Completely agree. So, yep. so, you, so you've got to begin with the end of mind. Um, the second thing I'd say is, you know, you need to have a system to make that picture a reality. Okay, mm-hmm. like when you do a puzzle, what do you do? You start from the outside, you do the edges, yep. and then you work your way in, and you look Sometimes at the colours. colours, yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. And then you go down to shapes, and you yep. do it a little chunk at a time. So when you, when you, when you push out to that 10-year thinking, Okay, you've got to come back to three years, one year, 90 days, and then just work, you know, on the puzzle one week at a time. And, every, you know, have that system in place where you're constantly working towards that, that, that vision. And, and, and as I said to you earlier in, in the um, conversation, that that's the piece that I missed. How to, how to, I could have a vision, but how do you bring that into reality? Um, and that's a, you know, have a system to do that. Mm-hmm. And then the last thing I'd say is um, you've got to know yourself, okay? Yeah. Now, if you think about um, that piece that's you, you can stare at it for hours. Um, and in knowing yourself, um, I'd say listen to the signals, stay humble, um, swallow your ego and put the organisation above yourself. Um, you know, we can, we can sometimes identify ourselves as the business owner as opposed to saying, well, if, if what's the right thing for the business? And if your if your you know unique ability is to be sales and marketing, and you should get a, a general manager in to run the rest of the show, uh, it's so so much more powerful if those other people can s- supplement your skill set. Uh, but it takes it takes uh, you know being um, humility and swallowing that ego to do that. Um, and lastly, with that, I think you know just make a decision. Even if it's even if it's the wrong decision, you can make another decision, but you've got to keep moving forward yeah. um, as a leader. Absolutely love it. And I thought what was really interesting when I was listening to you, you know, the fact that your wife could tell what was energising you. I think sometimes asking other people um, to kind of give you some feedback as well because obviously she could see when you were in your unique ability and you were loving what you're doing. And so if you can't see that yourself, it's okay to ask other people to help with that. Uh, yeah, but you know, one thing we say in this in this trade. So now yeah. that I'm, a, you know, is be careful what you wish for. <laughs> yes. Because my wife, uh, my wife has uh, said has encouraged me on this path, and 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 now we have she has to have a level ten meeting with me every week. So <laughs> brilliant! I love it. <laughs> be careful um, what you wish for. Yeah, you're a little bit a step ahead of us. I'm, I'm, I've, my, my partner, my husband, Steve, he's not quite so um, entrepreneurial, but he is starting to pick up on things like IDSing and, and just generally it starts to become part of who we are. And so he's doing that. And we have put together a bit of a familial kind of VTO. So we've got some sense of where we're headed and what we wanted to do and what our values are. So, yeah, it certainly does take over 
every part of your life. <laughs> but I don't know. I don't you, know if it's sad or we should celebrate it, but uh, you know, it works. For so. the greater good. It's all for the greater yeah. good. I'm, I'm all for it. Hey, Cam, it's been an absolute pleasure to, to have a chat to you. If people want to get in contact with you, what's the best way to get in contact with you? Yep, to reach out through LinkedIn, um, Cameron J. Ogilvie, uh, or to contact me on the EOS website through my email address would be great as well. Fantastic. Hey, Cameron.ogilvy at EOSworldwide.com. We've got the longest emails, haven't we? Mine's like deborah.chantry hyphen taylor at EOS Worldwide. But yeah, if you go to EOS Worldwide, yeah. look on the implemented directory, look for Sydney, you're going to find Cameron there. And of course, Cameron J. Ogilvy on LinkedIn as well. Cam, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing. Um, I will look forward to seeing you again in Sydney soon. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you.